welcome to this talk. And as I said, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak to you. Um, your association turns 50 years. Um, as it so happens, 50 years ago, most um, applied linguistics associations across the world were founded in around the 1970s, like from the mid 1960s up to the mid 1970s. So the Finnish association is right in the middle. Also the um, International Applied Linguistics Association was founded during that decade. And I've been thinking what connects that decade um, to our presence. And I've come back to one of my favorite authors, Hannah Arendt, who in 1970, so precisely at the time of your founding, and um, what she talks about in that book is that for the first time in human history, all people share a common present, that no event of any importance in the history of one country can remain a marginal accident in the history of another. And I think actually all those foundings of all those applied linguistics association is a neat example of that. But an even better or more striking example that um, all of us are connected and um, that no one is left untouched by events far away is actually the corona pandemic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic that we have all experienced this year. And um, to just make the point, I think it's undebatable that everyone on this globe has been affected by the pandemic, but um, to make this point linguistically, think about the fact that up until early this year, only a small group of specialists actually knew about coronaviruses. And um, in a short few months, all of us have learned the term and have become experts on how all these viruses work. Even more striking is the term COVID itself. The name for the disease did not even exist until February 11th when it was um, coined by the World Health Organization for the new disease that is caused by the novel coronavirus. And in this short month from 11th of February until now November, this word has entered the vocabulary of probably all or you know close to all of the world's eight billion people it has entered all the world's languages and that is certainly unique that one particular term spreads so quickly across the globe across linguistic boundaries and borders so in addition to everything else that um, the corona crisis or the COVID-19 crisis has been, it, ha it may well have been the greatest mass communication challenge in human history. We've all had to learn so many new things. We've had to learn how to protect ourselves. Um, we've had to learn how to deal with vastly different economic and social circumstances. We've had to understand how restrictions work in a particular jurisdiction in which we find ourselves. We've had to learn how to deal um, with Zoom. Those of us in the in in the play, in this talk here, um, and we've also had to learn how to deal with all this new information and an, a, a staggering amount of information that has come our way and that has definitely increased immensely over the course of the pandemic. So let's now just look quickly how such a mass learning event is actually organized or how it's theoretically organized. Theoretically, communication during a pandemic is managed by the World Health Organization. In fact, the World Health Organization declares a pandemic or 
an epidemic, a more localized outbreak in um, a particular place. So the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And now how does the World Health Organization communicate in a very hierarchical kind of top-down manner? They regularly brief nation states and um, the global public through their website, through their press conferences, through various means of communication. Now they do that through um, nine languages. They do that through English and all the other official languages of the United Nations. So that's um, in addition to English, that's um, Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, Spanish, and Spanish. And then there are three additional languages that they started to use a bit later in the pandemic for some of their um, communications. That's Portuguese, Hindi, and German. So overall, there are nine languages in which all this information is being communicated. And that goes to nation states, as I've said. Now, nation states then have the task to communicate the relevant information to their populations, to various stakeholders, to their health organizations, to um, doctors, to anyone who needs to make policy, and to the regulators, and to the population as a whole. And, um, Pure math tells us that there is a problem here. Um, first, there is the problem of these nine languages, amongst which actually one, English, predominates to all the countries in the world. And then there is the problem that there are 200 nation, or close to 200 nation states in the world, but there are five to 7,000 languages. But the nation states only officially communicate in one or maybe two, maybe three, and that's already going far languages. So clearly a large number of the populations in all the linguistically diverse countries around the world are left out. Um, the problem of bilingualism and, and minority populations was identified at some point in the crisis. So um, from May, June onwards, it seemed to enter the public debate that actually the various nation states were not doing a good job um, communicating to their minority populations. Um, so countries like, you see an example here from um, Peru, many countries actually started to translate their flyers or some key information like how to protect yourself, like how to wash your hands, how to keep your distance um, into various minority languages. The example that I'm showing you here was collected by one of my students, um, Alejandra Hermosa, and um, for a research project that we've been doing in a unit I'm teaching in our Masters of Applied Linguistics here at Macquarie University. The unit is called Literacies, and this semester all students had to examine um, language or communication problem related to the pandemic in a unit in, in a context that was of personal interest to them. And so um, Alejandra chose um, Peru and how, how relevant information related to um, the corona crisis, how to protect oneself, was communicated to the indigenous populations of the Andes who speak um, around 60 different languages. What she found was that actually um, there were a fair number of translations such as the one that you see here about how to wash hands. These were actually available in translation. So the example that you see here is a translation into Quechua Chanka. However, look closely and um, you can see that there is a problem. The problem here is that A, these posters are mostly available on a government server. However, the Andes and um, the rural populations 
in the end is are actually extremely poorly served when it comes to um, the provision of digital services of mobile connection. The problems of the digital divide. So one can assume that maybe they printed out these posters and distributed them. If they did, there is an additional problem that actually the literacy rate in those areas is fairly low. And then finally, there is a third problem here and that you can actually see in the images. What the um, guidelines here say is, they say that, you know, wash your hands with plenty of water, use plenty of water, turn off the faucet with the paper towel you've just used to dry your hands. Now, as it so happens, um, the rural populations in the Andes don't have very patchy access to running water. They certainly don't have faucets in the house, like individual personal access to water. So turning off the faucet is like a completely nonsensical instruction. And um, many of my students who also looked at communication campaigns in, um, in the Northwest frontier province in Pakistan, for instance, or in Lombok province in Indonesia and many other parts of the world found very similar things that there were posters available in various but um, that the posters were either not accessible because they were provided only digitally if they were accessible they may not necessarily be able you know the population might not be literate enough to read them and they provided information that did not make sense locally, that could not be followed by local people. From this discussion that there has been a linguistic response in some cases in some states over that came fairly late in the pandemic, but it came. Let me go back to, um, uh, develop a, a global north context. Let me go back to Australia and just discuss a bit more these various aspects of communication related to like linguistic challenges, challenges of communication channels, and challenges related to um, the kind of information that is available and how this information is accessible or not to minority populations. So the image that I'm showing you here is um, the website of the New South Wales government. And this provides information about testing clinics. Like um, Finland, Australia has been fairly good at keeping the virus under control and has got um, a very extensive testing regime in place. So everyone who has any symptoms is encouraged to test and um, that will allow to trace the clusters and nip them in the bud, so to speak. In or so if anyone has any symptoms and we've all learned to identify the symptoms, then they are encouraged to go and test. So. What happens if you have a scratchy throat? Well, you go online and see where is the closest testing clinic near me. And that's what you get. You get this website. As you can see at the top of the website, there is an element that says language. Now, of course, you need to know that language means language in your language, but that's for the multilingual population. So assuming that someone who doesn't speak English all that well, and um, in Australia, um, we have fairly good data from the census. So around 4% of the Australian population, that's about a million people, do not speak English or do not speak it very well. So um, this is the, um, the one million, around one million in this country would need um, this information in another language. As I say, it is available here, but you can only find it if you can actually read language in English and know that that gives, takes you to where whatever your language is. 
So um, if you click on language, then you get a list of 68 different languages, and then you can identify your language. Again, you need to know the name of your language in English because it is only provided in English and only in the Latin alphabet. What I did is um, I clicked yeah, on German. Hello. I clicked on German. And um, one would think that, um, you know, German is a major international and um, there's a lot of effort put into that language. So presumably if you Nein. have um, a trans, um, I'm getting some interference here. If you have, um, if you have a good translation, it should be in German. And um, what I found actually was that the translation is extremely poor. In fact, the translation is done by Google Translate. So it's an automated translation. And um, it's extremely poor. There is non-existent vocabulary. And um, it's not only that I don't know those words, I actually looked them up in dictionaries. A word like Fallstand or doesn't exist in a German dictionary. If you look it up on Google, um, it occurs exactly 70 times internationally across the whole internet. And most of these are actually in Australia for some weird reason. Um, there are literal translations that are only understandable if you also speak English or read English. Um, the word order is really strange, which makes it very difficult to follow. And there are pragmatic inconsistencies, like the distinction between um, formal and informal types of address. It's all over the place, so both are used quite regularly. And then there are some inexplicable errors, like um, in this example, where you see a set at the end and the sentence just ends with a set. I don't know how that came about. Now, um, that's for German. I've also looked at Persian, and um, Persian is completely illegible. Um, it's scrambled. As you know, Persian is written in um, the Arabic script, which actually works from right to left. And so, um, as I said, scrambled, the word order is all over the place. And um, so the point I'm trying to make here is, um, providing information in another language is not necessarily helpful if that information, if the translation is actually not comprehensible. In fact, there has been quite a bit of discussion around the Persian and Arabic translations in particular, and um, many community representatives said that they are feeling so disrespected by these erroneous, faulty translations. And of course, that leads to a breakdown of trust. So one could almost say, is, um, you know, is a, a, a terrible translation actually not doing more harm than not having any translation at all? Now, let's go back to um, the English website briefly. The, um, the site is actually not particularly difficult to read in this case. And I've done um, a reading ease analysis of a number of these websites in Australia. Many government websites are very difficult to read actually and require high levels of education. This one is not one of those. Um, it has a low reading level and also for context i need to tell you that um so i told you earlier there are about one million people in australia who do not speak english um, there are around 2.3 million people so that's um close to 14 percent of the population who have low literacy levels that we know from the pisa studies and um and from the PIAC studies, excuse me, about um, adult literacy and numeracy and digital skills. So we have 14% of the population 
2.3 million, as I said, and I'm sure there is some overlap with the 1 million who don't speak English, but they are not the same group. Um, these people have only elementary school, primary school level of literacy. So to actually write in plain English is extremely important to also provide the information to everyone. So this particular example has a low, a, a low level or a high level, excuse me, high level of readability. So it's easy to read. So great for um, everyone across, irrespective of what their literacy levels are. So one could think, oh, that works really well. However, one thing that we've discovered in ethnographic research, again, conducted by my students was that um, Although it may be relatively easy to read the text here, it's not necessarily easy for newcomers and people who haven't been in the country very long to be able to identify what they need to do in the first box here where it says enter postcode or suburb. And that is because newcomers often actually don't know their postcode. Or they don't know what a postcode is. They confuse the postcode and the street number. And um, ESL teachers in particular have found that um, they really need to sit down face to face or on Zoom, Zoom face to face with students in order to help them to identify where their testing location is. Now, again, if you don't actually have that kind of support, you may well um, experience symptoms. You may well log on to this website. You may well find that you understand what you need to do or that you need to do something, but you may, you may not be able to actually um, identify where you need to go. And that, of course, is a barrier that is damage that that is a threat to the population, to the health of the population as a whole. And that's why we need to care about these linguistic and communication barriers. So, um, as I said, we need to care about language and communication barriers. Timely, high quality information is absolutely crucial for the health of the individual but also for the overall well-being of the majority population. So all of us, irrespective of where we are with regards to our language and literacy skills re relative to the national language, need to have a vested interest in the fact that everyone understands what they should be doing. And um, this became very clear to us very early in the pandemic. Um, and over the course of the pandemic, I think it has become even clearer as actually trust has fractured and more and more populations are actually questioning, you know, what, what's going on and what they should be doing. So um, one thing that we started doing on language on the move very early in um, already in February, was actually um, start a series about the language challenges of the pandemic and um, just ask colleagues and people and friends um, to report on any kind of language and communication barriers or challenges in a particular local context. Our very first um, blog post was from someone from Tibet in China who wrote about um, how difficult it was for elders in that rural area to actually get the right kind of information. Since then, the series is ongoing and we've had, oh, we've so far got over 30 research blog posts from different part of the world. The snapshot or the screenshot that you've got here doesn't give you quite the right impression. It seems that it's quite Australia focused. It actually isn't. Um, we've got 15 different countries, I think, from all the continents. The one closest to um, Finland from the Nordic country was um, a post by Marta Kerebeck from Denmark about um, how 
how um, the pandemic has shaped has been communicated to migrant populations in Denmark, but has also um, reinforced stereotypes about migrants and foreigners there. So if you haven't seen it yet, make sure to look it up. Um, other places from Morocco to Mexico, um, lots of different case studies. Um, here is the URL for that. And now let's move on to um, another effort that we started on the back of the blog posts off the back of the language on the move series related to the language challenges of the pandemic. And that was that um, together with my colleagues, Lee Jia from Yunnan University in, um, in Kunming in China and um, Dr. Jenny Shang from uh, Shongnan University for Economics and Law in Wuhan, also in China, we started, um, we initiated a call for papers for a special issue of Multilingua. And um, when you heard Wuhan, you probably noticed that one of the reasons um, this was of such personal interest to me and my colleagues was that actually um, Jenny was a former PhD student of mine and um, she lives in Wuhan. I had visited Wuhan for a conference in intercultural communication in 2012. And so of course I, um, I was very concerned for her well-being, but really paid close attention to what was going on in Wuhan when that was the first epicenter of the crisis. So together we sent out um, a call for papers and um, we kind of anticipated like, you know, hopefully a dozen or, or maybe two dozen people would respond. Um, we were completely overwhelmed because over 200 people from uh, researchers from around the globe responded to our call for papers. And we just really didn't know how to handle that because they were all fantastic proposals. However, of course, a special issue has a very tiny word count. And um, so all we could actually, we really needed to send out so many rejection letters, which was really, really hard. And so we ended up deciding that the special issue should focus on um, case studies from the Chinese world. Because at that time in early April, we still felt, it seemed like the course of the pandemic would follow a linear pattern internationally. China was just getting their, their epidemic under control and it seemed like you know the world would follow suit, that China was like two, three months ahead of the world and we'd all get there. Um, now, of course, it has turned out um, that that was an illusion. Um, the Chinese have been very, very successful in getting the epidemic under control, but of course, um, many other parts of the world haven't and are just experiencing um, a second disastrous wave. So the special issue then came out in early September. We worked super hard and super fast to make it happen. And um, I just want to quickly introduce um, that special issue to you. So the key topics that um, are featured in the special issue. And just let me also thank the publisher, De Greuter Mouton. Um, all the papers in the special issue are available for open access. So click on the URL that you see below at the screen, or you can't actually click on it. So um, Google Multilingua and go to our special issue. That's issue 39, number five in September this year. And um, you can download all the papers, read them, use them in your teaching. So the key topics that um, our authors worked on and were interested in was um, related to language barriers as they affect global supply chains. That was a particular interest to um, people in Wuhan in particular, as in the early stages of the crisis, um, a, Wuhan is a major supplier of medical supplies globally. So when the epidemic hit there, the global supply chains with regard to masks, for instance, actually broke down. And um, on the other hand, they needed medical supplies to be brought in from other places. And so that constituted a huge logistical challenge. 
And um, that logistical challenge really needed to be met in languages other than English. Now in China, as I think is true in Finland, English is often like imagined as the language of global communication. If I need to communicate globally, then you know English is what does the trick. However, um, those global supply chains really related to China, Vietnam, China, Myanmar, and um, English really didn't cut it there. So um, that was a key topic that we explore. We also explore the communication experiences of migrant populations and indigenous minorities. As um, you may or may not know, China is actually has a high level of linguistic diversity. It has a high level of linguistic diversity with regard to the Chinese language, um, Mandarin, which is supposed to be the standard. You know, it's broken up in many, many different varieties. They call them dialects, but they're actually not mutually intelligible. So that's for the national language. Then there are 55 recognized minority languages in the country. Um, Mongolian and Tibetan, Uyghur are some of the larger ones, but um, a fair number of others. And additionally, China has become an incredibly attractive destination for migrants from across the world, from across the global south, particularly Southeast Asia, and also lots of international students. So um, we also have studies exploring what kind of communication barriers were experienced by those populations. And we have studies that look at the demand for language services and language workers in the context of, of heightened communication needs um, as people are stuck at home and um, just need to communicate more with regard to all this new information that I spoke about earlier, but also all these new challenges like those long logistics challenges that I've just mentioned. The key linguistic challenges that the authors in the special issue identify relate to the dominance of English centric global mass communication. I've already mentioned an example but the consequence of um, investing so much in English language teaching, for instance, in China actually is that um, there wasn't enough capacity with regard to other languages. And um, so that capacity really needs to be built. Um, another key linguistic challenge is that the long-standing devaluation of minority languages means that you can't just bring them on stream when you recognize that, oh, actually, we really need to communicate to our minority populations what they need to do, because otherwise this is a risk for everyone. You can't just, you know, create languages that can be used to communicate timely high quality information and communication channels that are accessible to those populations and that people trust um, you know because we've kind of whittled away at these minority languages for like you know hundreds of years so um that's uh, has been a considerable weakness in this crisis and finally um our authors also look at the importance and um, the, the ability of multilingual repertoires for building trust and building resilient communities. And so we also have a lot of positive examples. For instance, a study of um, uh, donations, medical donations that first flew, okay, uh, were flowing into China from Japan, um, from South Korea, from other East Asian countries, and then later on in the course of the pandemic out of China to those countries and how those um, medical donations and supplies actually came with classical Chinese poems. And um, classical Chinese poetry kind of unifies that particular cultural space and also had these, um, you know, heartwarming messages like we all live under one sky and um, so messages of resilience that um, helped to um, build trust, um, but also helped in international diplomacy, really. Um, the 
key implications that we identify in the special issue for applied linguistics and sociolinguistics is um, the importance for sociolinguistic epistemologies to include local knowledges and grassroots practices. And I think many of us are doing research with regards to minority languages, but I think we are quite some steps behind in actually um, taking forms of minority knowledge seriously. And so um, it's important to diversify the knowledge base. And that to me includes um, actually the academic voices that produce that knowledge base. We all have you know, uh, various different linguistic experiences and currently the field is extremely dominated by um, the academic voices from the English center, but um, also from Europe further out. And finally, um, I think one thing that we've sort of let go a bit over the years and that was very much at the heart of applied linguistics at the founding of your association at that decade that I mentioned at the beginning was really um, a, a dialogue with policymakers and activists. Now that kind of became a bit unfashionable as it became to be seen as so positivist and empirical. However, um, it's important to actually rebuild those bridges and connections. Otherwise, um, we may not have a whole lot of audience for our ideas about how, how linguistics should be applied. Um, let me just look at the time actually, because I kind of think I've been talking for a while. So I'll skip what I wanted to talk about here because it's all in a brilliant chapter by um, Professor Li Yu Ming in the special issue and you can easily access it. I'll also just end with a little plug for um, um, an international symposium that we ran last weekend on um, a Chinese, the Chinese equivalent of YouTube on Billy Billy about um, linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. And um, at the link here, you can actually, if you missed that symposium where all the authors of our special issue presented their papers, you can actually watch it there and it's all recorded. We had um, a Chinese session and an English language session. This is the link to the English session. With that, um, thank you so much for your attention and I'm here and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Kitos. <laughs>